Hello everyone and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis and I'm the Executive Director of APA Ohio and Vice Chair of the New Urbanism Division. I'll be the moderator for today's webcast. Today, Friday, November 7th, we will hear the presentation Measuring Progress, Performance Metrics as a Tool in Shaping Policy. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call the 1-800 number shown. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the questions box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. I would like to thank all of the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free. Today's webcast is sponsored by the Colorado Chapter. To learn more about all the chapters, visit planning.org slash chapters. And to learn about our divisions, visit planning.org slash divisions. On your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts for the remainder of November. To register for these webcasts, visit utah-apa.org slash webcasts. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, visit planning.org slash CM, go to your dashboard, select the, I'm sorry, select the Colorado chapter, do not select the Alaska chapter, and then you can select the title Measuring Progress, or you can enter it through the event code. This webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. Some recorded webcasts are available for distance education CM credit. For availability, check the webcast webpage again at utah-apa.org slash webcasts. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions. And we are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. And a PDF of the PowerPoint will be available by emailing planningwebcast at yahoo.com. I'd now like to introduce our speakers before we get today's presentation moving. Our first speaker is Molly Veldkamp. Molly AICP is a senior transportation planner with specific expertise in transportation design for livable communities. She's committed to creating effective transportation solutions for every community that she works in. Being an avid bike rider, transit user, and walker, Molly understands how important well-planned and designed infrastructure is to having real transportation choices. She is committed to creating effective and implementable plans that use creative public outreach to gather and incorporate community vision. Genevieve Hutchinson is a senior transportation planner working in the Transit-Oriented Development and Planning Coordination Group in the Fast Tracks Project Office for the Regional Transportation District in Denver. She blends her analytic skills with her passion for improving transportation options to develop innovative solutions for transportation planning projects. She has expertise in travel demand forecasting, transit planning, grant writing, as well as transportation and land use plans. She also manages the RTD Bicycle Program and works to ensuring multimodal connections and accessibility to transit. Our next speaker will be David Gaspers. David, AICP, Senior City Planner for the City and County of Denver, has focused on transportation planning, transit-oriented development, and walkable urbanism for the past seven years. He received his master's degree in community and regional planning from the University of Nebraska and has managed transportation and station area plan projects in both Denver and Fort Worth, Texas. David is currently the project manager for Denver's TOD strategic plan update. Our final speaker this afternoon will be Kate Iverson. Kate has 20 years of experience in the building construction and real estate development industry, facilitating the development and redevelopment of existing buildings and land as both an architect and attorney. 
Kate is currently the manager of transit-oriented development within the Regional Transportation District's planning development, where she works with both public and private sector stakeholders on implementing both RTD's TOD pilot program, a program which was launched at the end of 2010 to proactively pursue efforts to implement joint development at key locations on RTD's existing and planned rail system and other TOD projects. Kate joined the planning department in the summer of 2011 after representing RTD as Associate General Counsel, where she worked with RTD's project engineering teams on the development of the Fast Tracks East and Gold Corridors and the Denver Union Station Hub. Prior to coming to RTD, Kate practiced as a land use and real estate attorney in Denver, representing national developers on a wide range of real estate development matters. Prior to her career as an attorney, she practiced for nine years as an architect in Boulder, London, and Chicago, designing and managing large projects for governmental entities. Kate holds a BA in Art History from Williams College, a Master's of Architecture from Yale University School of Architecture, and a JD from the University of Den Denver Sturm College of Law. Kate is a licensed architect in Illinois and Colorado and a licensed attorney in Colorado. With that, I would like to turn the presentation over to Molly. Thank you. We are excited to be here today to geek out about data. We're going to be talking about data in three separate presentations. Um, slight correction for the order. Um, Genevieve and I will start out talking about how RTD has been using data to evaluate the investments that are being made through the RTD Fast Tracks program. And then you'll hear from Kate, who is going to talk a little bit about how data is being used to understand policies and refine those policies. And then David is going to talk about how data is being used at the City and County of Denver to direct investment to spur new developments in the TODs. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Genevieve to start off the presentation. Good morning, or good afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the, Molly and I will talk about the quality of life study for the Fast Tracks program. Uh, so we're going to go into some of the origin of the study, uh, why we're doing the study, what's included, um, how the information is reported, and then Molly will go through some example measures and talk about some challenges and opportunities if you want to do a program of your own. So just to give a little overview, the Regional Transportation District in Denver is, has a large service area, about 2,300 square miles, with eight counties and 40 municipalities. Uh, we do have 47 miles of light rail that we serve the district with. Um, 12 miles for our West Rail Line just opened in 2013. Uh, I want to give a little overview on the Fast Tracks program. Uh, the Fast Tracks is a regional rail ex or regional mass transit expansion program that was passed by the district voters in 2004, and it is funded by a 0.4% sales tax. Uh, the program includes um, six new corridors as well as three extensions to existing corridors, um, as well as the rehabilitation of Denver Union Station. And we are adding 50 new stations with about 21,000 new parking spaces, which is in addition to our existing 30,000 parking spaces. Um, and we will work to facilitate uh, bus and rail transfers from these new stations. Uh, and I want to give a little update on the, the construction. Um, we do have about 81 miles of bus rapid transit and rail under construction right now. Um, uh, and one, uh, two of our corridors, the, the gold line that goes out to Wheat Ridge and the east rail line to the airport is a public-private partnership and it's under construction and will be opened in 2016. We also have our 225 rail line, uh, which is uh, connecting to the east rail line and our existing southeast rail line. And that will open in 2016 as well. And we are constructing a bus rapid transit line uh, between Denver and Boulder, which is also scheduled to open in 2016. So what is the Quality of Life Study? Um, it's a multi-year monitoring program that is a, with the primary goal of objectively tracking and measuring how region changes um, as Fast Tracks is planned, constructed, and open for service. Um, I say multi-year because it is going to go at least two years after all of Fast Tracks is open for service. Um, and at this point, we have uh, several corridors that are awaiting funding, so this could be as much as to 2040. Um, in addition, we're also looking at external factors that affect, actually affect the Fast Tracks program, so we can answer 
not only how fast tracks affects the region, but also um, why schedules change or, or how the fast tracks program is affected by other, other factors. So why do we do the study? Uh, two reasons. Uh, the Federal Transit Administration has a requirement for before and after studies for quarters receiving New START funding, and we do have uh, three quarters receiving New START funding, the West Rail Line, the East Rail Line, and the Gold Line. Um, for that, we need to uh, report on what we planned for ridership costs and so on, and then what happens uh, when we actually open for, for several topic areas. But uh, the leadership at RTD decided to take it a few steps further and actually look at how the region is affected in many other ways. Um, and it's all based on the 2004 fast tracks plan that went to the voters that had three key goals uh, that are um, that are the basis for the for the quality of life program. Um, and those are listed on the screen, as you can see. Um, the plan also outlined a number of benefits uh, to the region. Um, for example. Fast tracks will contribute to economic development, improve air quality, and promote smart growth. So how do we know that the fast tracks program is achieving these goals and providing these benefits? And that's exactly what the quality of life study aims to, to discover. So the quality of life study uh, measures the effects of the program at three geographic levels. We look at the region, the individual corridors, existing and future, uh, as well as existing and future station areas. And, and while it's important to track uh, regional measures to provide context, um, we do understand that there probably will be more significant effects at the station area level. Uh, that being said, with 50 new stations coming online, we, as well as our existing stations, we, for the purposes of, of resources, we selected 32 representative stations uh, to do our analysis. And that's essentially two to four stations in every corridor, it's supposed to represent a cross-section of the various land uses um, and situations in the, the corridor at uh, hand. Um, and we do look at study, the study looks at quality of life in the context of uh, mobility, environment, economic activity, uh, development, and land use. Um, we had to make some decisions about uh, other quality of life aspects. Um, for instance, health. You know, we don't, the Fast Tracks plan did not specifically call out um, health as, as one of the items that would be affected by Fast Tracks. So we, we really had to narrow it down to um, what, what was specifically in the Fast Tracks plan. So these next two slides are meant to give you kind of an overview of our studies, or I'm sorry, our measures. Um, we did start with about 100 measures, and as I mentioned, we had to kind of narrow it down to those that would be most uh, illustrative of the effects of Fast Tracks. Um, we have everything from uh, direct job creation to energy consumed per capita, to safety perception of transit, uh, to bike and walk accessibility. Um, we do two types of reporting. Um, we do detailed reports every three to five years, and these are the full set of measures that, that this report covers. Um, we did a, a baseline report in 2006 um, for the full set of measures, as well as in 2010, uh, which covered the before conditions for our West Rail Line. But in between these detailed measures, we have high-level measures reports that come out, and those are uh, a subset of the 70 measures, about 10 to 12, that kind of give a snapshot of, of what's happening with the Fast Tracks program in the region. So now Molly is going to go over some of our example measures uh, to, to give you a sense of our findings so far. Thanks, Genevieve. Um, so I want to talk with you guys a little bit about some of the measures that are reported each year in our high-level measures report. As Genevieve said, these are a subset of all of the data that we collect. Um, so the first one that we want to talk about is directly supported jobs. This was one of the measures that was really important and we started to really feel the impact of when we had a great recession come to be in 2008. Um, you can see from this chart that through the whole recession and as unemployment was steadily increasing, RTD was creating jobs because of this fast tracks investment and it's important to, to see that and recognize that as the program continues. As Genevieve mentioned, the program is funded through a sales tax that was voter approved in our region. And again, you can see how the Recession in 2008 and 2009 really impacted the funding that was coming in for the program. 
and it was it did cause some some struggles with the project, but we've seen great recovery in the sales tax funding, and um, we can continue RTD's mission to build as much as we can as fast as we can because of the increased sales tax revenue. Another metric that we look at is fuel costs. I'm sure everybody remembers in 2008 when fuel costs came to its height. Here in Denver, we actually saw fuel costs go over $4 a gallon. And in that year, we also saw RTD's highest ridership on record. Um, and then in the following years, we saw fuel prices come down. They're coming down again. And interestingly, we haven't seen ridership decrease at the same rate. So lots of speculations can be there about, you know, people make a change to a new mode and see the benefits of transit. But we have definitely seen ridership continue to be steady, even with fuel prices decreasing. Another measure that we track each year is the new development that takes place within a half mile of the station. Again, with the recession, we see, we've seen new development decrease, and this is really a lagging measure. We've seen the impact of the recession in the years following and during the recovery, because the planning and implementation that was happening during the Great Recession, those projects were still continued and completed. But in 2011 and 2012, we definitely saw a decrease in completed projects as the planning and funding had decreased in 2008 and 2009. We are in the process of analyzing the 2013 data right now, and we're definitely seeing an increase in completed development as planning and investment happened in development in 2011 and 2012. Another commitment of RTD is to sustainability. And while none of the fast track lines have been opened in 2012, there's still a strong commitment to sustainability, even in the construction and planning of the projects. And the sustainability elements range from moving prairie dogs to minimize construction impacts to actually to designing stations to minimize the energy needs even through operation. So I thought one of the most fascinating ones when we were doing this report last year was looking at the actual design of the stations, where the grade as the trains come in goes up, so the braking that's required to stop the trains is lessened. And then on the way out of the station, there's a slight downhill so that acceleration, not as much energy is required to accelerate. So lots of different sustainability features in this project. And of course, as a transit agency, and looking at this, we are tracking transit usage. And you can see the, uh, the bar chart on the left is the annual transit boardings for RTD. But in addition to that, we also look at peer city boardings. And we use, we use the peer cities to understand how the region is performing from transit ridership in context and how are the trends that we're seeing in our city comparing to cities that are comparable and have similar transit systems. And of course, it's important to understand safety and security when people are making their travel decisions. They're certainly thinking about how safe they're going to feel. Um, RTD does a survey every three years about this information. And so far, they're getting great marks and continually great marks on this measure. Travel times and mobility is an important measure as well. When people are thinking about, should I get on the train or should I get in my car, they're definitely thinking about travel time. This is one of the more interesting metrics from a changing in methodology. Um, we used to do this measure. We used to collect this data by having someone get in the car and drive these routes. We then moved to using Bluetooth technology to collect the data. And this is a measure where we've actually moved into now using big data. Um, we've partnered with a company called Inrix to collect data from them. And they are using Bluetooth technology from navigation systems, from our phones, um, toll take data from the region. So it's a very robust data set that provides us really high quality data. And we also use that data to understand the variability in travel time. Um, it's not only how long it's going to take you to get from A to B, but also how likely are you to arrive at your destination at the same time if you leave at the same time. So we can see transit travel time variability is still higher than automobile in the region. And most of that is due to transfers and the time that it takes them to transfer. But as we see the 
investment of fast tracks coming in openings, that travel time should get more reliable as we're in fixed guideways. And we are expecting as a region to see automobile mobility and congestion increase and travel type variability change there. So we're looking forward to seeing what happens in 2016 when we open the lines that Genevieve was talking about and how this variability changes. And the last measure that we are going to talk about today is the um, destinations that are served by high frequency transit. Part of using transit is where can you get using that high frequency transit, which we define as service that is 15 minute, all 15 minute service throughout the day. And right now we have about 30% of the regional destinations served, and that will continue to increase as we continue to open the fast tracks transit lines. So in giving this presentation, we're talking about this to give people an idea of what it takes to create a program like this for your own project. And it doesn't have to be a region-wide large investment like fast tracks is. You can in we should all be looking at how well our investments are performing. And some of the key things that we've learned throughout this project are clearly tying the measures that you're going to evaluate to your program goals. It's important to, to keep that in mind because data, if you are excited about it, can be a lot of fun. And it's important to not go overboard in the data collection and reporting. It's also important, particularly in a multi-year study like the Quality of Life Report, to consider the changing methodologies. Our technologies are getting so much better year over year. Um, we need to be willing to change the methodologies that we have and setting up a clear decision path of when we're going to change methodologies. It's also important to set a reasonable t reporting time frame. We don't report on all 70 metrics every year. That's just not really a feasible investment. So we chose a subset to report every year. And then maintaining objectivity is, a, is a, an important element as well. Um, causation can be a difficult thing to prove, so we talk a lot about correlation in this project. So with that, we are going to pass things on to Kate to talk about the TOD performance metrics. Great. Thank you, Molly. I'm going to get... So I'm going to start, um, Genevieve and Molly have talked a lot about sort of system and quarter-wide data. I'm going to talk about uh, some measures that we're instituting to really start to look at how we deal with uh, development proposals at specific stations, um, and specifically linking understanding uh, the impact of form and placemaking on ridership development. Um, so I think one thing that's important to start off with it, just to give a little bit of context about Denver itself. It's a very, it's a, outside of the central business district, as a, as a region and as a range, it's been something that's been very auto-oriented. Um, and our transit system is one that has been built along existing rail lines. And what that means is that where the stations are located, it's typically in a fairly industrial location. And it's not necessarily in the kind of area that you think of as exemplifying really good TOD. So one of the things that we're looking at is we transition stations from um, essentially commuter park and rides into more vibrant, like strong urban places are, you know, how do we make decisions about this? How do we, me how do we measure what's happening? And is there really a link between what we think um, makes good place making but actually has um, economic and ridership impacts? So with that, um, you know, what is transit-oriented development? So very briefly, generally it is compact, it's dense, it's mixed use, it's more compact than the, than the area surrounding it. It typically is defined as being within either the half mile or sometimes more, um, in a more nuanced way, within a half mile walk shed of the station. And in Denver, that half mile walk shed is really critical because there are a lot of places that you can't actually get to that are within the half mile radius. So one of our big uh, areas that we focus on is how do you get people out of their cars, walking, biking, and to our stations by modes other than automobile. Um, and that means that things like connectivity are really, really key. They're also a lot less sexy than development, and they're a lot less sexy than big buildings. And so part of the impetus of our metric study has been to 
figure out how as an agency we can advocate for those and make sure that development is done in a way that pays attention to that. Um, this is really key. I mean, our system is about to essentially almost double in size within the next two years. Prior to fast tracks, there were 34 stations. Um, between 2016 and 2018, we will have 33 stations coming online. That's potentially, um, market conditions aside, 33 new areas for transit-oriented development. Um, and so getting this right, we really have one chance to build out our region and to build it out well. And so doing it thoughtfully and in a way that enhances the system is something that's really, really critical. So generally, kind of, these are two projects in the Denver area. The first is Belmar, which is the redevelopment of the old Villa Italia uh, shopping center. It's a new, it's not a TOD. Neither of these are TODs, actually. Um, but they're both redevelopments of old projects into um, sort of new, higher density, mixed use, strong, high quality or public realm. And I think that that's something that's really key as we're thinking about TODs is that that public realm component uh, is really critical to changing behavior, to getting people out of their cars, to getting them biking, to getting them comfortable with moving away from a more auto-oriented culture. So this is kind of what we want. And the problem is, is that this is what we have. Um, these are two of our stations. And there are significant, significant infrastructure requirements. We have needs for streets, sidewalks, storm, water quality, landscaping. Needless to say, this does not look like that. So as we move forward, thinking about how we do redevelopment, we really need to be cognizant of what we're prioritizing and what we're able to fund and how we make that happen. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a specific project, and then I'll dive into the metric component of it so that um, you can see how some of the research that we're doing to try to help support the direction we'd like to go. So one of the things that we're finding is that in order to make these redevelopments happen, we have to, pop, we have to partner um, with the public sector, with our local jurisdictional partners, but also with the private sector. And that the combination of sort of those three entities and their potential funding sources are really critical to making these types of projects come into being. Um, one, I think, that's a recent good example is the redevelopment of Alameda Station. So our station, which you can see in red on the screen, um, do I have a map? I do. Great. There it is. Um, was originally a surface parking lot with a, a pull-off bus loop. Um, it's behind a Kmart um, in behind a parking lot and essentially completely not really visible from anything. Um, there was, however, a very strong planning effort in place. And here's the original station conditions you can kind of see what it looked like prior to redevelopment. Uh, so despite that, there had been a lot of planning effort looking at how this whole section of the city, which is roughly a couple miles from the central business district in a great uh, thriving, surrounded by great thriving residential neighborhoods, uh, could move from being big box oriented retail into something that fits within this urban fabric. So there's a lot of planning in place. Um, and then a lot of components that needed to come in to make that happen. Um, the stormwater system, that infrastructure that was placed was not sufficient to support development. Uh, the public right-of-way was not in place. There were lots of the street grid was not complete. Um, streets were uh, private streets running through the adjacent marketplace. And what um, happened was that RG, along with the city and county of Denver, and the developer of the adjacent uh, Kmart and there's also an Albertsons and the Sam's Club there, all came together to look at how the station could be redeveloped. And then this is the, uh, the plan of the station, sort of this, the proposed station reconfiguration. There's a residential project that is located uh, to the north. The street grid is continued through the site from along Dakota Avenue that runs east-west, and then the street grid was all built out and continued along what's called Cherokee Street down to the south. There was a new transit plaza that was configured, and the buses were moved out of a standalone bus loop um, and into onto the street. So kind of the big picture, 
lots of people at the table, lots of different moving parts, um, and lots of decisions that had to be made about how we were going to prioritize which infrastructure investments to make. The initial proposal that came to the table essentially had the transit plaza and the station behind the residential development with no additional connections. And what we came to realize as a transit agency is that we did not have a good mechanism for beginning to negotiate the form of the buildings relative to the overall form. It's something that, although Denver has a very strong um, form-based zoning code, it really deals on a block-by-block -block basis, and it doesn't look at the connectivity between the station and the adjacent development. Um, so one of the things that we did in that context were to develop POD design criteria that as an agency, when we redevelop any kind of RTD property, um, we require that the developer meet those. There's uh, some shots to give you a sense of the ultimately proposed project, uh, which is now under construction. So another component of what we do that supports the redevelopment work that I've just shown is we do research. And one of the things that um, has already been highlighted in the quality of life is that Fast Tracks is really a unique opportunity to start to understand the relationship between transportation, land use, and urban design. Um, we have a new system that's coming online. We have areas that are not uh, designed, don't have the kind of urban design that we think of as ideal for making transit-oriented developments, and we have an ability now to look at how things are functioning both before and after. Um, so we think we know what we want. We think that um, these types and forms of development are going to be more effective at driving ridership than a, a typical auto-oriented one, but we don't really know that. And in terms of helping us to make decisions about prioritizing investment, we decided to take a look at sort of trying to link, use the quality of life data and link it with um, actual on-the-ground changes to the physical form of the community. So what do we want to know? Well, kind of what are the actual long-term economic impacts? How do we prioritize investment? Is it more important to have mixed use? Is it more important to have connectivity? Is it more important to have density? You know, we have a lot of, we understand in an ideal scenario what every station redevelopment might look like, but when we have to choose one thing over another, are there ones that can be proven over time to be more effective than others? So to that end, we put together um, something that we call the TOD metric study. And basically, the goals of that study are essentially to look at the, the quantitative measures that are already being collected through the quality of life program and link them to qualitative things like connectivity, land use, density, and mixed use, and to track those over time to see how stations evolve and change, changes in ridership occur, and other things occur. Um, so where do we select stations? Basically, we looked at ones where we now have land, where development is likely to occur. Um, and we also looked, just from a cost-effective resource nature, at the ones that we're already evaluating in the Quality of Life Report. Um, so I'm going to dive a little bit now into the metrics that we've used and the field work that we've done to begin to collect this. So on the quantitative metrics, you know, these are things that uh, Genevieve and Molly have already touched on, um, and they go, they go into it in a lot more detail in the quality of life. But basically, we're trying to look at, you know, what are our ridership metrics? How much are people boarding? How frequently? You know, how are they using our parking? Where are the people who are using our parking uh, spaces coming from? What are, what are crime rates? Um, what, are, what, does, what is happening from a development perspective? Um, what's happening on changes in retail and uh, office lease rates, what's happening to property values, um, and information of that sort. And then take that for each station and at the same time begin to link it to these qualitative metrics. And we looked really at six different things. The first is land use, the second development intensity, ground floor activation, enhanced streetscapes, bike and pet access, and then the presence of any kind of public space, public realm, or plaza. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about how we're actually going to document this. And we came up with essentially a series for each, um, each metric, a description, 
um, a table, and then with that table, an actual map that's collected in the field. So the intent is that over, this needs to be something that can be done fairly consistently year after year after year um, with different people collecting the data and making sure that it uh, continues to be fairly um, consistent from researcher to researcher. Um, so one of the things that we've done is to, on the land use side, identify types of land uses, identify the half mile radius as opposed to the half mile watershed, and then within that, divide that into um, a series of uh, squares where the person will go out in the field and essentially identify and color code the different types of land uses. Um, this is similar then uh, for development intensity. We're looking at low intensity, medium intensity, and high intensity, um, or very high intensity. And again, that's, this is the same. Here's the land use for our 10th and Osage station. And then this is the actual development intensity. So you can see that it's quite low. And what we would like to see over time is that it, as this is collected every two years, we can kind of see where um, not only changes in uses are occurring, but also things are densifying. Another thing that we've looked at on the connectivity front is trying to understand the on-the-ground connections for both bicycles and pedestrians. So what we've done is um, marked it so that anywhere that you can see a solid black line, that's a sidewalk, a block space with a sidewalk, bike lanes are dashed, and intersections that are uh, workable crossing intersections are dotted as well. The other thing that we're doing is doing a photo inventory so that we have um, at each, every two years we will see exactly how the, how the landscape has changed so that we have that for reference as well as the actual metrics worksheets themselves. So challenges to doing this, um, one is how you actually take the, these more subjective qualitative concept, concepts and create data fields. And we've done that by using the gridded system that will identify numbers of uh, essentially percentages of an overall whole for both density and land use. Um, we did find some lack of consistency between we sent out a number of different interns and got different results. And so we've um, tried to really simplify the chart. It was our charts, they were much more complicated at first and decided that uh, the consistency of data was more important than the sort of level of nuance. Um, and ultimately what we hope is that as we continue to collect quality of life data and we continue to collect this qualitative data, we'll begin to see correlations between changes in building form, changes in street connectivity, changes in land use patterns, and actual changes in economic development and ridership as well, and can begin to analyze those to help us uh, make better decisions and policy decisions. So I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. Thanks, Kate. Uh, David Gaster is here with City and County of Denver, and I will be uh, talking about our uh, transit-oriented development strategic plan. And I think it ties in really well with everything we've already heard today. Um, as Jenny mentioned, I think initially, um, in 2004, uh, Fast Tracks uh, was a ballot initiative that passed that is going to greatly expand uh, the, the passenger rail system here in the Denver region. And in particular, with the city and county of Denver, uh, we quickly realized that we're going to have 41 different station areas um, to uh, all plan for. And so to react to that, uh, we developed a TUD strategic plan back in 2006. Uh, and there's a lot of great successes out of that plan. Um, based off the work program there, we were able to develop uh, planning efforts for over 20 stations, whether that's a station area plan, uh, a neighborhood plan that included a station area, or a general development plan. Um, we did have an entirely new zoning code uh, adopted in 2010, so many of our station areas already have uh, new form-based context-sensitive uh, zoning uh, that encourages mixed-use, high-density development. Uh, the 2006 plan really focused on uh, establishing and strengthening our external partnerships. Uh, so like folks with uh, the Denver Housing Authority, 
Urban Land Conservancy, which uh, manages the TOD fund I'll mention here in just a moment, as well as RTD and all the different activities that they are uh, doing at the different stations. Uh, the TOD fund uh, was established after the 2006 plan and uh, is a, um, uh, an effort with multiple partners to uh, set aside money to uh, preserve affordable housing at different station areas. And that's been a very uh, great success and is actually expanding regionally now uh, beyond uh, the boundaries of, uh, of Denver itself. So that's great. Uh, we also have spent millions of dollars on infrastructure. Uh, Kate mentioned the Alameda station. Uh, I believe the city and county of Denver uh, uh, committed over $20 million uh, in of infrastructure into that project for the Dakota outfall and, and other construction to facilitate that TOD activity at that station. And uh, we've also collaborated with our Urban Renewal Authority, Dura, on uh, multiple TIF opportunities. Um, but as any good strategic plan does, once enough action items are, are checked off um, and enough time passes, five or six years, uh, you should um, look back at that plan and update it on the, the set uh, path forward for the next five or six years. Um, with the 2006 plan, it was really focused on planning um, and mainly around the uh, planning department with the city and county of Denver. We really wanted to broaden the scope and, and focus on implementation this time around. So we really involved uh, not only our own department, but Public Works, the Office of Economic Development, Department of Finance, Parks and Rec, to all be uh, a part of um, uh, developing this plan and, to, and really allow the plan to provide a foundation to guide TOD through um, very specific uh, action items at different stations, as well as um, a broad set of uh, policy recommendations at, at, at a citywide level. Um, to do that, uh, we wanted to take a quantitative um, evaluation of all of our stations um, and then uh, hopefully uh, be able to use those metrics to monitor our success or lack thereof at the different stations. So the next time we update this plan in five or six years, we'll actually have uh, the ability to look back and see what has been a success and uh, build upon those, see what things haven't worked, and maybe uh, change things up. Um, whoops. Uh, so, uh, essentially, the, uh, the plan, which we've called Transit-Oriented Denver, uh, the narrative really focuses on implementation uh, from a city perspective uh, and establishes a certain foundation for QD success in the city and uh, talks about uh, connecting and reconnecting our neighborhoods, not just through TOD, so development at the stations, but also really fostering transit communities. Um, so that's the, kind of a larger geographic area where we're not only trying to have development at the stations where possible, uh, but also improving the first and last mile connections to existing neighborhoods. Um, so we're creating a, a, a more walkable, uh, pedestrian-friendly Denver that is uh, uh, you know, transit-rich and really allows our citizens to access a lot of their daily needs without getting into a, a car. Um, we established TOD principles in the plan that helps um, additional planning as well as um, just really focused on what TOD is to Denver. Uh, so with this, we're talking about um, really having great connections uh, within the station area, uh, the opportunity to be innovative in our uh, development, uh, location efficiency, uh, the placemaking components that Kate was talking about a little bit earlier ago, um, having a broad mix, not just uh, housing and jobs uh, choice, but as well as diversity of incomes and age groups. And then also, really importantly, a, uh, a shift kind of a shift in mentality and, 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 and mode shift as well um, so that um, we have the opportunity to live more of a uh, car, a less dependent lifestyle um, and uh, really hopefully a, little, a healthier and more sustainable um, uh, life within uh, Denver. Uh, we do feel we have a really strong foundation for TOD success here just looking at uh, some demographic trends. Um, over 70% of households in Denver um, could be considered a market for living in a TOD. So essentially, uh, single households, uh, married couples with no children, as well as baby boomers make up 70% of households within Denver. It's a pretty astonishing number. Um, and it's well documented with a lot of articles out there that Denver is a very popular city for millennials to move to. Um, and I think we have over 12,000 apartment units being built in and around downtown Denver uh, to house those millennials. So 
uh, it's definitely uh, having a big impact on Denver. Uh, we do see that people are driving less in the region. At the same time, we're attracting millennials. Uh, our population is aging. So again, that's uh, growing that uh, market for TOD. And overall, the state is densifying. There's much greater urban population here in Colorado. Uh, and we can see that in tracking some of our permit data. So you know, how successful are we with directing growth to station areas and these areas that we plan for uh, TOD? If we just look at uh, last year's permit data, 20% of all permits uh, for the city and county of Denver were in TOD areas or station areas. And from a value standpoint, 40% of all permitting valuation occurred within station areas. So what does that really mean? Um, if you look at the investment per acre ratio, for every $1 of a permit uh, pulled in a non-TOD area, over $5 uh, of permits were pulled within station areas. So that's a, a pretty impressive indicator that people are attracted to these areas. Uh, the, the plan lays out a aspirational typology. Uh, this helps um, have a better understanding of what each station uh, is trying to become. With 41 stations, it's pretty clear to us that not all stations are created equal. And so it's important to kind of set the stage here. So if we're uh, trying to attract or, or um, uh, direct a certain uh, type of use uh, that we know where we're, or what type of stations are most appropriate for that type of uh, development and intensity of, of use. More uh, interest, I think, with the typology is what we call our functional overlays. Uh, the institutional and entertainment uh, overlays are kind of obvious. An institutional overlay is a, maybe a medical campus or a, a college uh, um, educational campus, entertainment, uh, more of our sports stadiums and, and that type of thing. But the innovation district uh, is a, a kind of a neat idea where we have uh, numerous stations that are really in industrial corridors, a lot of existing industrial buildings. We're starting to see a lot of um, uh, change in those areas, more residential coming in. But we want to make sure we can promote and maintain some of those industrial uses uh, because they are attractive, these large buildings, large spaces, to uh, startup companies that may be interested in um, you know, clean manufacturing, green tech, those type of things. Uh, and we want to make sure we foster those opportunities from an economic development standpoint. This is what the map looks like with the uh, station typology. Obviously, uh, downtown is um, where my cursor is right there. Most of the kind of general urban and, and uh, urban areas within the you know, existing uh, uh, Denver area are near downtown. Our urban centers, which are a little more intense, are more sporadic and kind of uh, kind of a sub-regional focus for um, higher intensity development. And our suburban stations are, are a little more less intense and, and not as um, um, walkable in nature. So to get towards our action plan, the actual metrics and how we got to this, our station evaluation had three components. A market readiness uh, component really asking, you know, how is the market uh, really there for development at each individual station? Is it ready? Our uh, development potential, so what's the actual capacity for development at each station? And then the TOD characteristics, so how walkable is the station right now? And the more walkable a station is, the more likely that um, immediate development would be really true TOD and not just uh, development that's in the station area, but it's actually oriented towards um, the station itself. Uh, so we developed a, a categorization uh, out of that evaluation and developed those action items from that. Uh, so the evaluation really went through two screens, uh, market readiness. So that's referring to things like household growth, commercial investment, um, unimproved land value ratios, and uh, recent property transactions. I think there's probably 10 or 12 different um, uh, uh, criteria points that we actually had with the market readiness. Same thing with development readiness, uh, 10 or 12 points, but just some highlights. Uh, parcelization patterns, um, which can indicate uh, an opportunity to redevelopment. Ownership patterns, uh, the amount of developable land available, and the uh, amount of infrastructure investment to date and what is actually needed. So we went through this um, evaluation and screening process uh, to categorize our stations. Uh, and we plotted them on this, this great uh, uh, scatter plot, which uh, has a tons of information, but it's pretty confusing and hard to understand what it's really telling you. So uh, we got that feedback quite a bit. So we said, you know, let's actually develop something that's a little easier to consume and develop this uh, system-wide scoring map. So this is uh, pretty simple, I think, anyway. 
Um, the darker the color you see the circle, the stronger the market uh, is, and the larger the circle is the greater the development potential. So, for example, if you look at this um, Broadway station right here, it is quite dark and it is uh, relatively large, so that's a station that has a lot of market readiness and strong development potential um, right away. Other stations um, have much, uh, maybe a much smaller circle like Yale here, so it's a lot lower development potential and uh, not as strong of a market. So, uh, and uh, the third component, the TOD characteristic, is actually um, plotted on the outside of, of the slide here. So on the very top left um, are stations that are the, the least walkable, essentially, uh, and working in a um, counterclockwise motion all the way to stations that have the highest walkability and most uh, strong TOD characteristics on the ground today. Um, so when we looked at, at, at the uh, kind of TOD characteristics, uh, and Kate kind of talked about this a little bit already, uh, we really noticed that um, how most people look at station areas are in half-mile circles, and that's just simply not the reality. Um, here in Denver and probably in many other areas, there's a lot of barriers that uh, impact um, how to access a station. So this is an example of looking at the walk shed, a, a, a half-mile walk shed opposed to a half-mile circle. This is the Evans Station along our uh, southwest uh, corridor, uh, and uh, I think it's been around since 2000 or so. Um, and it, it looks like you have a lot of development on both sides of the tracks that are, are, have access to the station. But the reality is, is that with the station here, uh, you not only have the light rail tracks uh, next to the station, but a freight corridor, uh, an interstate, and beyond the interstate, there's actually a, uh, the South Platte River. So there's a lot of barriers for easy connection to these stations. Uh, so the reality is a, a half-mile washhead becomes completely separated. So um, this makes, kind of raises the point of, of the uh, first and last mile connections at, at our existing and future stations and how important that is to really realize the full potential of these stations uh, for our residents. So the categorization led us to uh, what we kind of call a TOD continuum. So uh, the strategized stations uh, here in yellow on the map are really the stations with the lowest market potential or uh, least development uh, readiness. Uh, the catalyzed stations in kind of the light uh, teal blue are really the stations where um, the city feels that we can have the biggest impact on development in the near term. These are stations that may show relatively strong market but we've identified a lot of uh, infrastructure barriers that are limiting the development potential, or maybe uh, the, the market's not quite there yet, and uh, we can also need to push on that where there's actually a, a, a strong set of infrastructure um, already in place. And then the dark blue are energized stations um, that have scored the best, essentially, and really are, are in a place where the private market can kind of go in and do their thing and, and um, size maybe, maybe small moves by the, the city. Uh, these stations should take care of themselves. So we developed uh, the action plan, like I mentioned. We didn't do this for our downtown stations. We're pretty, uh, you know, unique. Uh, but I think 28 different stations received an action plan. Uh, this is an example of uh, two of them. So this uh, kind of quick snapshot of a station shows uh, kind of the existing condition, the typology that it's aspiring to be, the scoring results of the uh, station evaluation, uh, its current status from a planning and investment standpoint. So is there a plan in place? Uh, is there have been an infrastructure analysis? So do we really know how much infrastructure is needed here? Is the zoning already in place, entitlements, uh, that type of stuff? Then a, a list of action items that we'd hope to accomplish in the next uh, five years or so uh, with our catalyst stations, which again are the ones that we feel we can have the biggest bang for our buck. Um, a lot of those action items are focused on infrastructure prioritization and and various financing strategies to actually fund those projects. And then uh, with the catalyzed stations, we actually list catalytic projects at each station. Uh, so we actually worked with our public works department. And we looked at all the different station area plans and, and neighborhood plans that would have identified recommendations for various infrastructure projects, um, prioritized those, uh, trying to identify the ones that would have the most impact on TOD, or essentially removing barriers to, to uh, private market development and then actually uh, cost of those projects. So we have a good handle on actually how much um, we need to actually figure out how to fund at these different uh, stations that 
from our evaluation have uh, real potential for TOD in the near term. Uh, we also um, established, I think, 16 different uh, citywide policy recommendations um, that we want to accomplish um, over the life uh, time of the, the strategic plan. Uh, a couple of them that are really highlighted here. The first two are to establish a TOD action team, which is really an outgrowth of this planning effort, as well as appointing a TOD steward. We actually have uh, funding for 2015 to actually have um, uh, someone that can actually really uh, be focused on implementing this plan and uh, trying to uh, continue to push TOD forward in Denver. And then a part of that is um, a, a recommendation out of our Department of Finance to create stationary financing plans for our catalyzed stations. So we've got this list of infrastructure investments we want to accomplish. Uh, we know money is always tight. Um, that's not the case in Denver. I'm sure that's the case everywhere. So we wanted to see if there's other creative financing solutions besides just trying to rely on a general fund or a, a CIP um, process, uh, capital improvement program process to, to identify uh, financing for some of these infrastructure projects. So how can the um, city really use this plan across all these different departments? This is just a kind of a, an example of how we want to try to uh, kind of um, use the plan and align the city approach to TUD while measuring our, our progress. Uh, this is a 38th and Blake. Uh, it's a station that will be opening in 2016 on the East Line. It's the first station outside of uh, Denver Union Station on the line that goes out to the airport. Um, we know from our, um, our plan here that it's a catalyzed station. So it, the market is really heating up in this area, but we know there's lots of infrastructure and uh, improvements that we need to do to really um, allow the TUD to hit its fullest potential. Um, there has been a station area plan established here, so the vision is set. Um, the typology is general urban, so we know it's relatively intense. And it's an innovation district, one of those that has a lot of industrial uses. All the purple on the map there are industrial uses that um, are kind of changing over right now. Um, and we know there's a, 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 we did a next step study on this. That's a, an infrastructure analysis, so we have a general idea, pretty good idea on the um, types of infrastructure investments we want to accomplish at this station. So if in our department in, in community planning and development, we uh, go ahead and look at that walk shed analysis that we did and then go back and look at the station plan and its recommendations for various different infrastructure improvements, we can identify um, something like a propo pro proposed pedestrian bridge, excuse me, um, uh, that uh, can open up um, a, more acreage to development along Brighton Boulevard, which is where we're seeing a lot of development uh, starting to occur. Uh, Public Works has cost that bridge. We know how much it costs. Uh, they were working with our finance department to actually identify uh, financing plans that are catalyzed stations that can help actually fund this project. And then it, at the end, when we're making decisions on, on uh, infrastructure investments um, with city dollars, uh, our Office of Economic Development can actually do a station area physical return analysis, which helps identify uh, how much uh, increase in the tax base could we expect for new development at this station. So our uh, decision makers uh, can make informed decisions about uh, investment at our different station areas. And that is uh, the presentation. I think we're open for uh, questions. Great, thank you. And we do have questions. And uh, everyone, feel free to continue typing your questions in. Um, it, it looks like we have quite a large batch for you, David, so I hope you're prepared. Uh, I, I, <laughs> uh, I, I think this, this first one starts with you. Um, could you please talk more about working with the public and decision makers to develop your metrics? Did you just propose the measures based on goals and get their reaction? Could you, could you just talk a little more about that? Sure, yeah. It, well, uh, it, it's something I didn't point out, actually, it, it, which is a pretty important. Um, the strategic plan itself is essentially an internal document it's out, out in the public. You can find it on the website. But the intent of it is actually to develop a work program around TOD for the city um, over a certain time time frame, essentially about five years. Um, that's the same case with the starting 2006. So it was not actually adopted by city council, and it's not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, the uh, typology, for example, that I discussed is really based off of 
the station area plans that were developed since 2006, which had a very large uh, public input component and has been adopted by city council. Um, so we're really, with this plan, trying to actually implement the, the vision that was established by the public in the different, various different station area plans. So um, the, uh, the actual criteria points uh, we developed um, with um, the input of all the different um, departments and agencies within the city, including as well as our, some of our external partnerships, such as RTD. Um, and we did have uh, a, a public outreach process that helped us in, inform uh, things like the TOD principles that I talked about. Um, but we didn't really have uh, the public in, input on the uh, evaluation itself. OK, thank you. Um, and how large are the squares and the half-mile walk shed that you, that you spoke about? And what, are, what, what is the size based on? So I think you're talking about the squares in the uh, RTD um, metrics yes. presentation. Is that yes. right? Yeah. So honestly, I think that they're less about size and it's more about measuring percentage. Um, so we wanted to get it to a size that uh, the two, at, at 200 squares, it gives you um, a big enough number that you can begin to see a, a certain level of grain of information. Um, and we're really looking at those uh, percentage changes over time as opposed to something that measures specific uh, distances, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> back to the, the TOD metrics, who are the users of the metrics that are outside of the agency that developed them? Uh, right now it's just an internal agency document. We have only done our initial first level of uh, sort of one year of data collection. We're going to do another this coming spring. Um, and so as we continue to develop that over time, I think it will become more useful. Right now it's really looking at uh, becoming a long-term analytical tool. So outside of really the TOD department at this point, very little, I can see that it's something we would share with local jurisdictions in their planning departments and planning processes as we have more data to use. OK, thank you. Uh, next question. The, um, the, evalu the station evaluation matrix, uh, how was it determined what the market readiness criteria? How, 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 was, how did you determine the market readiness criteria in the station evaluation matrix? Um, in terms of if the market is ready and to what extent? Sure. Uh, I might go back a few slides, if you don't mind, Christine, just to visualize this for everyone. They were very pretty. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we did most of this internally, but we had a great um, uh, consultant as well. MIG helped us with this plan as well as EPS. but. Yeah, we worked very hard on making the plan um, very user friendly, so we appreciate that. Yeah, that's nice. Um, the uh, market readiness. So I, I show five different um, uh, criteria on there. So things like uh, household growth um, over the say last, last ten years, uh, com recent commercial investment, uh, recent property transactions, unimproved land value, were the types of um, data points that we collected. Um, and uh, you know, essentially compiled in a, a massive spreadsheet in EGS files, um, and then we scored those um, individually, and then that, that resulted in, in, in a, a number that, when you uh, compare that to the development readiness then of each station. So again, this is just a sampling of, of the data points, but things like the size of parcels, which um, Typically, if the larger the parcel size in the stationary, the more likely redevelopment may occur. If it's very parcelized, very small, small uh, parcels um, with a lot of uh, different ownership, um, it, it's more difficult to redevelop. Um, how much in infrastructure investment already occurred, et cetera. And, and those have received the same type of um, um, evaluation where we would assign a point total essentially to those um, and score it. And then the result of that scoring uh, created this um, 
the scatter plot or matrix of uh, the stations. Um, so I kind of skipped over this because it is very complicated, but essentially uh, on the left um, is the development potential scoring of each station, and on the, the bottom axis is the market readiness, um, you know, being graded out from low, medium to high on, on this scale here. Um, the size of the, uh, the symbol, either a circle or a square, indicates those TOD characteristics, um, which didn't go through the same screening process, but we applied them to the stations. Um, and then the, um, uh, the, the shape of the symbol indicates um, whether the station is already open, which is, are all the ones that are circles, or the ones that are still under construction, um, which are the squares. And then the colors are the various different corridors. So that indicates um, southeast, uh, central, west, east, or um, gold line, essentially, for us. Um, so th this is how it was scored. Um, and I can provide more details to anybody uh, if they want to email me on, on the actual numbers that's behind them. Um, but that then resulted in this, this map, which is a little easier to understand and communicates the, uh, the evaluation itself. Um, while you still have that map up, um, there was a question. Let me try to find it. Um, I'll find it. Let me ask you another question while I find the one that I'm thinking of. <laughs> um, so we're talking about a lot of information for 20 stations, which is no small feat. Uh, how long did this take, and approximately how many staff people were involved in getting all this information and all this data together for all 20 stations? Yeah, the station evaluation had 28 stations uh, that we looked at. Um, and it probably, we, our process was about a year and a half, um, but that was actually drug out quite a bit um, because of uh, the time it took to do things like um, the costing of the different infrastructure projects and the prioritization of those projects. Uh, the actual station evaluation we probably achieved within about six months. Um, you know, we have a really robust um, uh, data set. Uh, it's actually an open catalog. You can just go to the Denver website and, and get a lot of GIS uh, information. Uh, so we've, we've been tracking this, uh, these types of uh, information uh, pretty extensively. And then um, EPS, who was the economic uh, planning firm that, that did the evaluation for us, um, also were able to, to resource, um, you know, have resources like Dr. Cog here locally, or any of their um, real estate um, uh, data that they can pull from various different um, companies. So um, it wasn't that difficult to get the, uh, the numbers. It just, uh, you know, it's a bit of a time-consuming process. OK. Um, did any of the analysis take into consideration rural bus routes that eventually fed into the system? And if not, uh, how do these areas, if at all, do they fit into the system anywhere? Sure. Well, uh, answer would be no. Um, and I, I think you said rural bus routes. So just to clarify, this was just for the city of Denver, not the region. Um, so we're pretty much a, uh, we're surrounded by suburban communities, um, except for the area by the airport. So there's no real rural Denver, <laughs> uh, even though we're a city and county. It's pretty much an entirely a city. Um, and this is just uh, an evaluation of TOD at our rail stations or future rail stations. But one of our uh, policy recommendations moving forward is to look at non-rail TOD planning. Uh, so just for example, um, RTD is actually going to be leading a, um, a station plan for the Civic Center uh, station, which is in downtown here and is primarily a, a, a bus uh, station. Uh, so that's an example of non-TOD planning. And we have various other um, studies going on for um, uh, enhanced bus or BRT along Colfax, which is a major arterial here. So that could be a future area where we'll, we'll look at station areas along that route for uh, BRT TOD. And then uh, hopefully moving forward in 2015, uh, as a city, we're going to be looking at a kind of a, a city-wide strategic transit plan that, again, looks at more uh, bus routes and enhanced bus and and which routes make the most sense to uh, uh, increase um, 
kind of the type of uh, you know localized transit that we want to provide our citizens and be working with RTD on figuring out how to finance those type of things, et cetera. So those are things moving forward. So maybe in five or six years, our next evaluation will include uh, non-rail um, stations. But it, this evaluation was just for rail stations. Thank you. Um, in terms of the metrics and determining uh, all these data points, were was social justice considered considerations weaved it all into this in terms of low-income users? Well, kind of a yes and no. I think directly um, that wasn't a, a, great, a set criteria point because it's difficult to, to um, narrow in on that. But as a whole, I, I think it, it played out that way as, yes, it was a, a considered a factor. If you look at the list of uh, criteria uh, points for um, the market, essentially, uh, you would see uh, some of those indicating uh, um, the need in, in, in certain stations um, or same thing with the TOD characteristics. Uh, so, for example, um, Decatur Federal, which on the map is right here, relatively close into downtown, um, market is, is okay and it, it has its development potential. We just uh, recently wrapped up a station area plan there. Um, most of the population of that uh, station area is in um, uh, public housing provided by Denver, Denver Housing Authority and um, a very strong um, immigrant population um, uh, from Somali and Vietnamese and you could name it. I think they had um, a planning effort where they had seven or eight different translations occurring at the same time at different public meetings. Um, so that did actually play into a part of this, but it wasn't a specific uh, criteria point. Okay. Um, now we have our weekly um, NIMBYism question. Uh, ha have you dealt at all with any NIMBY issues? And if so, uh, did that play at all uh, in, in, a, in any way in estimating market readiness or other types of metrics? Yeah, uh, it, I wouldn't say it's prominent along the line. Most uh, stations um, that have development potential have landowners that, that see the value of the station being there. But over the course of the last 10 years, we have identified stations, um, and I, I think RTD could speak to this too, actually, that um, don't see the value of a station being really close. So, for example, um, there's the Southmore station in Denver. I can put my cursor on it. Uh, that's been in place since 2006. Uh, you can see it's a relatively dark color, so it has uh, a market there because the southeast line has a lot of jobs uh, going down to the Denver Tech Center, et cetera, um, a lot of development potential, um, uh, relatively a, a large amount of development potential at that area. But there's no, no real TOD activity there. We tried to do a station area plan um, probably five or six years ago, and the neighborhood just was not interested in, in – um, Additional development occurring there. It's uh, majorly a, a single-family neighborhood. Um, in fact, the the station is on the west side of um, the interstate, and the houses that are right next to it have a wall built against it, so they don't even have access to their station, even though it's literally in their backyard. So there is examples of that. But generally, as a whole, most of the station areas that have the strongest development potential um, realize the asset that the station uh, is. I think also this is, Kate, just to jump in, one of the things that's been really key that, you know, when we're looking at um, TOD development is that a lot of that early planning, station area planning and uh, public process was completed long before we started looking at TOD performance metrics and long before this TOD strategic plan occurred. And so, you know, to the extent that the downturn was beneficial in any way mm -hmm. at all, it did allow some of that kind of thinking and planning work to occur to get public outreach and public input at that point in time. And so, you know, this is really, it, these are kind of next steps, not technically next steps, but they're kind of growing out of that early planning work. Yeah, that, that's very true. And in a sense, again, the 2006 plan that we developed was much more about stationary planning. Uh, and But we have accomplished a lot of stationary planning, and a lot of people are planned out. They actually want to see some TOD to happen. So that's where we really, and we are seeing that. Uh, so that, that's what the really the, the thrust of this um, strategic plan is all about, is implementation of TOD to really kind of get things moving. 
Um, Kate, this is more of a technical question. What did you use as units of measurement of land use intensity for different types of land uses? So for land use, um, this is one where we started off um, trying to have a little bit more of a fine grain approach. We discovered that at least in the field and with what we have on the ground now, that was difficult. So I mean, we broke it into pretty basic, um, and I should say that land use versus development intensity are two different things. So land use is just literally what exactly is it used as. So we had residential, office, um, commercial retail. We did not distinguish between, we initially tried to distinguish between retail use and commercial use, and that just became very sort of difficult to uh, have consistency around. Um, mixed use, and by mixed use we mean vertically mixed use. Um, civic, institutional, industrial, and then transit, and then sort of parking and vacant properties went into other. On the uh, development intensity, we defined low density as sort of, we did it by stories of buildings. Um, and so again, we have, you know, we're using underlying mapping so we can see the area that's, co that's covered by the building. And then is it one story to two stories? Is it three to four? Um, and then I think we've got one five to six and then seven and above. Or Genevieve. I can. Oh, go ahead. And I'm happy to. I'm happy to email if someone wants to contact me. I mean, we can send more specifics about the actual sort of metrics we used. So I think I'm happy for someone to email me directly. Thank you. Oh, good. And your emails are back up on the screen now too. Um, uh, Molly or Genevieve, um, how are directly supported jobs? measured? And is all new development attributed to TOD, or do they consider market trends in surrounding areas? Uh, so for the directly supported jobs, we measure it in full-time equivalents. So we collect the, the number of staff, uh, as well as construction con contractors and, and whatnot on all the projects, um, get their hours and, and convert that into uh, full-time Uh, on the projects that don't work full time all year. Um, and then the question about uh, development, Molly, do you want to jump in on that? Oh, yeah, sure. That's data that the TOD group collects, and they look at all completed development. Is this actually transit-oriented development, transit-adjacent development? Um, it's just a completed project that takes place within walking distance or the half mile radius of a station. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a few questions related to the quality of life study. Um, the first one, it, it looked like the measure of travel time and travel time variability used only AM peak travel hours. Uh, was PM or Saturday weekend travel time considered at all? Um, no, in the in the fast tracks plan, we only uh, sort of promised that we would uh, um, <laughs> reduce uh, or our work on mitigating congestion in the in the peak periods. Um, that being said, we also did not focus on PM. Um, we we, we kind of chose to just look at AM. Um, again, you know, with this kind of a, a size of project, with the resources that we have, um, that's something we didn't really mention. Um, is that this this project was developed to be using um, minimal funding, um, so existing data sources as well as um, a small team. Uh, so we, we focused on AM uh, uh, peak only. Okay. Um, and someone mentioned using a tool to evaluate uh, the quality of life, and was this done through a survey, or could you talk more about what this tool was and, and how it was utilized? Um, we're, we're looking at each other with, with quizzical looks. 
don't recall mentioning a tool per se, um, but we do have a customer satisfaction survey that, that RTD does uh, every three years that, that measures a number of different um, elements of customer satisfaction, including safety perception, which is what we use it for. Um, yeah, the overall study is intended to evaluate quality of life from a myriad of different perspectives, but that may have been the one that the, the customer satisfaction survey may have been what they were referring to. And if not, um, perhaps you can type in um, further explaining what you uh, what you mean. Um, so I guess while I have the two of you, um, can can you go more into the technologies uh, that you're using for measuring the system? Uh, the system in what in what way? Let's see if the. Yeah, I think, I mean, the broad answer to that question is we use a myriad of data sources to understand each of the 70 metrics that we look at. If someone's interested in diving in, we have a 150-page document that details out the specific methodologies for each one of the metrics that we look at that is, we're happy to share with people um, pretty dense stuff, but if, you, if you're interested in setting up a program and are interested in specific measures and how we collect them, that information is available if you send an email. Um, it looks like in terms of the technologies, uh, they were referring to you mentioning Bluetooth. Hmm. So maybe specific to the travel time. I think so. so. Yeah, the, tra the travel time variability and just general travel time that was one that has one of our metrics that's seen the most change. And like I mentioned, we started out with pretty low tech um, using GPS and stopwatches to actually drive corridors and select the travel time that way. We had sort of five runs, as we called them, for each one of those. And then we moved into Bluetooth capture, which is a method where you set out basically a little sensor that picks up Bluetooth tags. So that can be from nav navigation systems, from vehicles, it can be from all of our smartphones that we all carry around. It, it picked those up and we did matching based on generic numbers that were attached to the devices. And then the, the latest change that we've made has been to go to the big data, um, where we actually partner with NRIC data, um, where they are actually collecting their travel time data from navigation devices to vehicles, um, the navigation apps on the smartphones, as well as road sensors and traffic cameras. And they basically compile all of that data on their end and kindly sell it to us so that we can report on it. And if there's more detailed questions about that, we can I mean, we can talk a lot about that, that data. So feel free to email for more information on that. Um, okay, could someone please uh, define vertically mixed use? Oh, so by vertically mixed use, so um, a lot of times when we talk about mixed use communities, you'll have a standalone, they'll be dense, but you'll have something that's a standalone. And we typically mean that there is one use on the ground floor and other uses above. So what we often see here is uh, retail or hopefully future retail, often fitness centers right now, um, on the first floor with residential above, with um, office above it. And the reason that we distinguish between those two is that in sort of uh, denser, more mature cities, that's fairly frequent, but it's a much more costly and difficult kind of construction to, um, to, to build. And so it's, it's where we'd like to go, um, and we'll take, you know, dense standalone residential, but we'd like to see more of the, the former of that, different uses between floors. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Next question, has the TOD planning process considered preservation or increasing affordable housing around station hubs? And if so, how? 
Uh, well, from the city of Denver's uh, perspective, uh, yes, but not necessarily through this plan process. So those type of things are usually addressed um, through uh, a stationary plan, um, which has uh, the public input um, you know, kind of needed to, to address those things. Um, I did mention that um, the 2006 plan helped uh, spur the TOD fund being established here, which is a partnership of uh, the city and county of Denver, Urban Land Conservancy, various nonprofits, um, and a few others, uh, the financial institutions that established a $50 million revolving fund that helped uh, preserve um, affordable housing at our different station areas. So Urban Land Conservancy has, I think, at least three or four, maybe five different sites um, at various different stages of um, pre-development or development of, of affordable housing at our different stations. Um, and we've also worked closely with uh, Denver Housing Authority, which is a major landowner at, at multiple stations, um, to make sure that uh, they have the opportunity to um, uh, really make sure we maintain an affordable housing mix of those areas. Tenth and Osage is a great example of that. It's a, one of the stations just south of downtown. Um, it's in a kind of established residential uh, area. They have had Denver housing um, uh, uh, residential units there for decades. Um, and they took a, a advantage of the station opening there to completely rebuild that development into a very more typical 1950 style housing project into a mixed income, um, uh, mixed uh, age um, development that has, I believe, about a 10 or 12 story senior housing component with kind of more four or five story um, uh, multifamily that has um, a range of income points. So um, really improved um, uh, the affordable housing uh, opportunities at that station in particular. Um, so that, it wasn't a necessarily a, a push in this plan process, but it's definitely been a, a priority for stationary planning. And this is Kate. I'll jump in just quickly as well. I think one of the difficulties that we have in Colorado is that there is actually a Colorado Supreme Court case that prohibits um, jurisdictions from to be rent control. And so in many other parts of the country, there's an ability to, and right now, from a development standpoint, all we're seeing is um, apartment development. We're not really seeing any for sale or condominium development. And so those pieces would fall under um, most cities' inclusionary housing ordinances. Because there's an inability, a legal inability, to require rental affordable housing, it's very difficult to sort of tackle that um, on a lot of different fronts, not just in the TOD context, but in the context in general. And we've had to look to form with other kinds of entities to ensure that we can preserve housing opportunities near stations. Yeah, the City of Denver has an inclusionary housing ordinance for um, for sale products of uh, any, any development uh, project that is uh, 30 or more uh, units attached to it. But as Kate mentioned, uh, most of the development occurring, at least recently, um, in a multifamily has been um, rental. There has been a, a issue here with a construction defect law that um, has made it challenging, um, at least from the developer perspective, to do uh, for sale condos in multifamily. So we've seen a lot of apartments being built right now. Uh, that may be resolved here in the, in the future. But as of right now, most of our um, multifamily is, is rental. And that does not include um, that, that inclusionary housing ordinance um, for the legal reasons that Kate mentioned. Okay. Well, guess what? It's that time. It's 2.30 Eastern. So uh, we will close up with that. And uh, thank you to Genevieve and Molly, Kate, and David for speaking with us today. Um, obviously, this is a popular topic. We had lots of questions, and I was able to drill all of you. <laughs> and uh, we had a, I think we had a good time. Uh, so thanks again, and thank you to the Colorado chapter for sponsoring today's webcast. And we will see everyone next time. Thanks. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.